During his years as a student and engineer in Maryland, Kidinvisa held nearly every job in aid. Since moving to Hyderabad over a decade ago, he has walked through the fields, forests, and the corridors of power to get a fair deal for India's farmers and farm workers, all while promoting sustainable practices for the health of people and planet and food security for all. He is a convener of the Raita Swaraj Vedika and the Alliance for Sustainable and Holistic Agriculture. He has a master's degree in engineering from the University of Maryland and is currently a final year law student whose finals are in limbo due to the lockdown. He has, along with a huge team, coordinated relief efforts in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana and will talk about the past month and what lies ahead for farmers, farm workers, and food supplies. Uh, everybody for joining uh, and, uh, you know, Hush, uh, Ashish Kamani and uh, Sivaji. Uh, and Bilal uh, for sharing the uh, you know situation in different parts of the country. Uh, I uh, uh, like Sima just said. I don't want to repeat uh, things which are already said, uh, but just a couple of things from our personal experience here. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I mean there was one of the questions also on the chat, uh, you know, which was asking whether uh, the government has been negligent or incompetent. Right. I think this is one question that, uh, you know, in various discussions, uh, it, it keeps coming up, uh, you know, that we've been having, uh, even with people in the US and our friends and so on, uh, that in most places, governments seem to be uh, messing up the response to COVID. So in that sense, uh, you know, India is not such an egregious uh, example, I think, especially for people in the US. Uh, they feel that, uh, you know, the government, uh, you know, over there may be messing up more. Um, uh, but I think basic the, basically the reality is that uh, the center, uh, I think, has been very, very unthinking uh, in its uh, plan, uh, you know, for the lockdown and so on. Uh, personally, I think even in aid, when we had the discussion uh, like a couple of weeks or a, or a week uh, before the lockdown, uh, we were also, uh, uh, you know, uh, we were also saying that, you know, India should do some kind of a a uh, larger plan of uh, social distancing and some kind of uh, restriction on movements and so on. Uh, but uh, the way it has been done, uh, I think essentially what the one, one picture is basically that uh, the center has acted very unthinkingly and uh, the state governments are to a certain extent mopping up the, uh, 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 you know, floor, you know, for the damage uh, that has been caused. Uh, but of course, the state government's uh, responses have been pretty uneven. I think in different states, uh, they've done better. Some states, they've not done that well. Uh, but the people who are uh, facing the brunt of it has been the poor uh, and the workers. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind is also that uh, the migrant workers are at a, uh, uh, you know, at a disadvantage, uh, not only because of their, uh, 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 you know, being poor, not having a stable home, uh, not having work and all that, also because not having a political voice. Uh, see, basically, if uh, if a Bihari worker is stuck in uh, Telangana, in Hyderabad, right? Uh, ultimately, uh, though the Telangana government has announced uh, measures for helping the migrant workers here and passed a GO, one of the earlier states, uh, to pass a GO which promised both cash uh, support and uh, rations for the migrant workers, ultimately, the migrant workers are not their voters uh, here, right? Uh, whereas they are actually voters in Bihar. Uh, so the Bihar government has put in an app where they now, I mean, belatedly, like after 21 days, uh, they are transferring uh, 1,000 rupees uh, to the accounts of people and so on. So some governments have come across, come through with those kind of things. Uh, but ultimately, where they are located, they are not even voters. So they don't have a political voice even. So in that sense, they are literally, uh, uh, you know, uh, forced uh, to live off charity either charity by the uh, people, by the general public, which I think is a heartening uh, thing that, you know, many people have responded very well, uh, but also charity by the local government, because for them, uh, they actually don't have much political rights or voice with the local government. So that's the situation in which they've been put, and that is starkly visible for us, you know, from the day after the lockdown, uh, you know, when we started uh, dealing and helping, trying to help the migrants. We found that uh, the state governments took almost four or five days uh, to really, uh, you know, measure up the situation and be able to respond. And I think that responsibility for that completely rests with the central government uh, because of both the suddenness and complete unplannedness and lack of 
planning together with the state government that happened. So I think that was that that's very clear. Uh, but one of the things is also that that comes out very starkly is that the government doesn't understand how the country works, how the majority of the country works. Uh, and uh, uh, I think this was evident in the demonetization, you know, the way it happened. Uh, and uh, it kind of, this is a reiteration of the same thing, that the informal economy, when you take a certain big step in the country, how do the people in the informal economy uh, get impacted by that and uh, are there coping mechanisms, are there mechanisms in which you can actually, uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the blow can be either lessened or they can actually be empowered, uh, is something the government has no clue about. And uh, of course, even people like us, you know, because I'm more uh, engaged with the rural uh, India, for the last one month, I've been actually much more uh, exposed uh, to the reality of urban poverty and so on than I was uh, before. Uh, so Sikandarabad railway station, for example, is very close to my house. Uh, it's just 10 minutes away. And then the day the lockdown was announced, it was just announced with a four hour notice. And uh, uh, so, and then I started seeing pictures of uh, long uh, queues and, you know, huge number of people stuck at the Sikandarabad station. So when I went there after a day, I found that basically the railway department had uh, shut down the station and said that, you can't be inside the station. Actually, the station, the railway station would have been a good uh, shelter, uh, at least a makeshift shelter for four or five days. But they decided in their wisdom that everybody should be out of the railway station. So they were all in on the streets uh, surrounding the railway station. And you could see that actually uh, one of the things is that uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's not just migrant workers being stranded. It is a new homeless being created. Uh, this lockdown has created actually new homeless people uh, because a uh, lot of people, I mean, I met so many different kinds of uh, workers there, you know, at the standard railway station. Uh, for example, a lot of people who are working in hotels. Uh, and uh, I was asking them, Do, don't you have a small house or a hut or something, you know, where you live? Uh, they basically all live inside the hotel. Like uh, when I say hotel, it's not like a, uh, you know, it's not like Marriott Hotel. Uh, what I mean is small eateries or restaurants or, uh, you know, various kinds of eating places, uh, which are, I think, maybe a lack of them maybe there in Hyderabad. Each of them employs these workers and many of them actually work as daily wage workers and they sleep uh, in the hotel where they are working and then they get up in the morning and do that. So as long as work is there, they have a home. Uh, as long as the, uh, uh, you know, the establishments are running, they have a home. Uh, if the establishments close down, they don't have even a home. It's not just losing a wage. Uh, so this has happened to lakhs of people. Uh, and that this is, again, something which was very clear that the government had no clue about that this is going to happen. Uh, the construction workers uh, who live in shacks, uh, you know, on the work site, suddenly they become homeless. Uh, so this whole uh, kind of things, I think uh, it could have been anticipated if there was a better uh, understanding and uh, analysis about the ground situation, it did not happen. So I think uh, this is a huge uh, uh, failure. Uh, and we found that actually there is so much uh, migration that is there. I mean, in a, a village called Gudihatnur in Adilabad district, which is a tribal uh, belt of uh, 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 Telangana, we found that there were 20 families of Rajasthani people. What were they doing there? They came there to sell sweaters because uh, you know this was over the winter, just at the end of the winter period, right? So it's a cold, uh, cool place there. Uh, so uh, I mean, I didn't imagine that in Gudihatnu there would be people from Rajasthan, right? So and then uh, so this is the kind of uh, you know so many pockets of migration that is there, and uh, the unfortunately you know the states have uh, the state has largely failed to take care of them. So. Uh, even now, there's so much desperation. You know, yesterday we were helping uh, 20 workers who were walking back uh, from, uh, you know, a factory in Bolaram where the factory owner was not taking care of them. They got fed up. And uh, two days ago, they started walking uh, to where? To Singrauli in Madhya Pradesh. This is like almost, I think, Uttar Pradesh border. Uh, we tried desperately to persuade them to stay, to not uh, go because it will be a, a, you know, dangerous and a very difficult journey. Uh, but they simply wanted to get home. So this is the reality, right? Uh, so when we are talking about what is the way forward, uh, I think that there has to be a facilitation of any worker who wants to go back to their home state and uh, some kind of, a, you know, from a health point of view, some kind of a quarantining uh, system uh, can be there in the home state. Uh, 
but uh, not uh, you know leaving them in the lurch uh, here where they uh, are uh, you know not even natives of the place and they don't have a political voice uh, so i think that is something that we should kind of uh, root for uh, because we had people who were walking all the way back from Hyderabad uh, to uh, Vishakhapatnam, which is like, you know, I think uh, 800 kilometers away. Uh, they did reach their place and over there they were kept in a quarantine for uh, for a couple of weeks uh, uh, in, in a village school, you know, which is very close to their village. So that's a very different thing from being stuck in a makeshift shelter in Hyderabad. Uh, basically, health-wise, uh, that is better. Uh, you know, for them to be there, uh, you know, uh, 10 people uh, in a village school quarantine, uh, rather than 200 people in a small shelter, government run shelter in Hyderabad. So I think uh, this, I think, is something that we should definitely uh, push for. And uh, 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 just a couple of other things, you know, we have been running a helpline. Could you yeah. also then come to the farmers issue and then okay. we'll Sorry. take yeah. the rest of the things in the Q&A. Right, sure. Yeah. So uh, as far as the... Uh, so, so there's a lot of uh, you know, lot of discussion about the urban poor, and I think that that is uh, uh, you know reasonably understood now. But I think the impact of this lockdown on the rural poor and the rural economy is also uh, very big. Uh, so, when we look at the farmers' uh, uh, situation right now, uh, so uh, we we know that the government uh, uh, you know does take care of uh, the people in the urban areas uh, being able to get uh, enough you know, vegetables or fruits or uh, some of these other things that come on a daily basis. These are the perishables, right? Uh, the non-perishables, of course, uh, would have been stocked from earlier. Uh, but uh, the government uh, uh, has not taken any measures to ensure that the vegetable farmers get a good price or the people who are, uh, you know, growing the fruits uh, get a good price. So the supply chain is there. Uh, but uh, uh, then actually when I go to buy uh, uh, vegetables now uh, during the lockdown, uh, they are sold right in front of my house and the prices of vegetables have actually fallen. Uh, where I used to get uh, something for a kg for 40 or 50 rupees, now I get for 25 or 30 rupees. So this is the kind of mind boggling way that the economy is working, uh, which basically means that uh, the farmers who are actually growing those vegetables are getting nothing. Uh, so we've talked to several farmers in Telangana and they are finding really uh, even harvesting of the vegetables being a waste uh, because they are getting two rupees per kg, whereas their cost of harvesting itself is three rupees per kg. Uh, so they, they, they actually make a loss by harvesting. Uh, but then if you don't harvest one day, uh, uh, basically you need to do harvesting every two days. If you don't harvest, uh, you know, those uh, fruits are going to rot on the tree. Uh, you don't get the uh, next uh, flowering and fruiting, right? Uh, so uh, they are stuck in this kind of a cycle, making losses every day. Uh, this is for the vegetable farmers. As far as the uh, uh, you know other crops are concerned, like you know wheat, maize, uh, chana dal, these are some of the uh, major crops which grow in the winter season and are harvested around this time, uh, and paddy also. Uh, so uh, in in Telangana, the government has announced that they will do uh, village level procurement for all the crops. Um, but that is uh, started only for rice. Uh, for maize also, they said they'll do and they set aside as a budget, but uh, farmers have harvested, they've kept uh, temporarily at their homes. Uh, this government still has not uh, started uh, purchasing. Uh, but in many states, actually, even the village level procurement is not in place. Uh, like in Punjab, for example, the, uh, the government has simply said that we'll open the mandis uh, and then we'll uh, make sure that there's social distancing by uh, ensuring that not too many farmers come to the Monday on the same day, right? Uh, but I think that is such a foolish policy because ultimately all the farmers are going to harvest pretty much in the same week. Uh, and uh, there is very little storage uh, facilities for most of the farmers, especially small farmers. Uh, so unless you have a way of actually, uh, 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 you know, procuring at the village level or uh, uh, they being able to sell at the village level, uh, the whole Monday system is simply not going to work. Uh, so at least uh, here in Telangana, they've thought about that and they've tried to make arrangements, but in many states that also has not happened. But even in Telangana, the implementation, we have to see, you know, how it's actually going to happen. Even simple things like, you know, there are not enough bags available for bagging uh, the produce uh, at the village level. So that's a major uh, logistical challenge. You know? Uh, and then, uh, you know, what price they get. See, unless the government steps in and uh, purchases, right now for maize, the government said they'll purchase, but they've not started uh, purchasing. So the traders are now buying at the village 
uh, at 1300 rupees you know whereas the minimum support price is 1760 uh, this is the situation for maize uh, in uh, uh, telangana uh, and for chana dal actually the government hasn't even announced the procurement uh, so basically i think farmers are going to make huge losses uh, whereas actually the production has been good uh, this uh, season largely uh, so they are going to make uh, huge losses unless Uh, the government really steps in in a big way to do uh, village uh, level procurement uh, and like uh, uh, artist and sima ji uh, uh, everybody has said i think the uh, energies uh, wages uh, full wages have to be paid i think the unemployment allowance demand is also actually a uh, a concession uh, to the government actually full wages should be paid because the government itself has a notification which says that all private companies and all government establishment should pay the full wages during the lockdown period even if the worker is unable to work right this is a written uh, uh, you know notice from the government uh, to to all the establishments uh, so by the same token they should just be paying full nrgs wages to all the registered uh, workers so this has been a big uh, demand uh, even from before they started announcing the financial package but unfortunately the government has not included uh there is supposed to be something coming out tomorrow or day after we hope that they will do that um uh, and uh, the other thing is basically that uh the uh, in the rural uh, areas essentially the nutrition uh, is also a problem especially uh, where uh, uh, you know children are dependent on anganwadis and so on and uh, anganwadis uh, uh, being closed down and uh, schools being closed down not getting midday meals and so on uh there is a huge uh, food security issue at the uh, village uh, level also uh, so wherever the state government really steps in to give all those anganwadi rations uh, to the village uh, to to the women and children uh, in their homes uh, there i think that uh, you know the, the situation may be decent but in many uh, states uh, uh, you know that is also not uh, happening so i think this is the reality as far as the rural uh, is concerned and uh, the other issue with agriculture is that actually much of the harvesting is dependent on migrant labor uh, so the same migrant labor which is actually uh, uh, you know caught uh, 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 you know stranded uh, in different areas uh, but also the lockdown uh, you know just before the lockdown was announced uh, uh, you know, many of the migrant laborers also started going back and even after the lockdown many migrant laborers uh, have uh, tried to go back to their uh, states so actually in many places there is a shortage of uh, migrant labor for uh, harvesting uh, also so that is another uh, big impact that's going to be there on uh, agriculture uh, and uh, just one last thing i wanted to say is basically that uh, uh, when we've been running this helpline uh, we uh, in the last 6 uh, days you know since the lockdown has been extended Uh, we got calls, uh, you know, requesting uh, food for about twenty-five thousand people. You know, just in six days, the calls that our helpline got, which is a private helpline, which we have barely publicized. You know, uh, so uh, we believe that the requirement for that actually would be maybe a ten times uh, of that, and this is just from the uh, Hyderabad and surrounding uh, uh, areas. Uh, so basically, uh, what it shows is that even in 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 a state like Telangana, where the government uh, has announced uh, you know th- that 3.35 lakhs uh, uh, migrant workers will get rations and so on that is still a huge underestimate because the real extent of migrant workers in telangana would be at least uh, 20 to 30 lakhs uh, so they are only at uh, you know 10% uh, level as far as their estimates of uh, migrant workers are concerned um, I-, i think i'll just stop there and uh, you know we can have any questions so i'll be quite late